This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Wednesday, November 4th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. It's down to the wire in the U.S. presidential election between Republican President Donald Trump and the Democratic candidate Joe Biden on Wednesday. The winner of the vote remains very much in doubt, with the outcome hinging on a handful of states where a flood of mail-in ballots triggered by the coronavirus pandemic remain to be counted. We'll have more on the hotly contested race shortly. Be sure to follow up to the minute election at buenews.com. Now to Burkina Faso, where the nation is holding its elections on November 22nd, but more than 400,000 people displaced by armed conflict may not be able to vote. Henry Wilkins reports from Ouagadougou. Fighting between Burkina Faso's military and Islamist militants has displaced more than a million people, half of them this year alone. Ouagadougou's Pazani suburb hosts nearly 3,000 displaced, including Fatima Wadrago and her five children. They fled to Gachi village last year after armed men killed six of their neighbours. We used to farm in the village and sell the produce at the local market, but we had to leave because of the terrorists who came and killed people. Over 400,000 displaced people like Quadrago won't be able to vote in Burkina Faso's November 22nd election as they lost identification papers or weren't offered registration. The government says it was not possible to register voters in areas of the country overrun by armed groups. But the Independent Electoral Commission says people in those areas who can travel to register elsewhere can still vote. We don't know why some people did not come to register. Is it because they don't have documents? We don't know. But I insist that we receive any Burkina Bee that has all the required documents for registration. Political analysts say authorities are balancing the security challenge with the need for democratic elections, but also taking a risk. The inability of many Burkina Bay to vote in this election is a considerable challenge. Of course, if five out of the 13 regions are unable to vote, it will leave a cloud of illegitimacy around whoever uh, is elected president. Troops from West Africa, France and the US have struggled since 2013 to fight a growing terrorist insurgency in the Sahel region, with attacks nearly doubling every year. A State Department and rights groups have accused Burkina Faso security forces of abuses and killing of civilians, fueling terrorist recruitment. For displaced and excluded like Quadrago, if she could vote, she would vote for change. I would vote for the party able to ensure we go back to our home village and have access to water, food and security. Meanwhile, unable to farm, Widrago ekes out a living collecting sand to sell to builders. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Wagadougou. The home of Ivory Coast opposition leader Henri Conan Bidi on Tuesday was surrounded by riot police. In this video obtained by Reuters, police can be seen gathering at Bidi's home just before a planned news conference in which he was expected to announce a parallel government to challenge President Alassane Ouattara. The riot police dispersed the protests after the government accused him of sedation for heading a transitional council announced the previous day. It was not immediately clear if anyone had been arrested. BD supporters say Ouattara's landslide victory was unconstitutional. Results of the presidential election gave Ouattara a landslide win after Bedi and fellow opposition candidate Pascal Afing Ngesan boycotted the vote. Fifteen people have been reportedly injured as Ugandan security forces dispersed crowds gathered to protest the arrest of opposition leader Bobby Wine on Tuesday. David Doyle reports. <laughs> Smashing through windows of his vehicle, Ugandan police arrested opposition leader Bobby Wine on Tuesday, aides and witnesses. 
said. This is what the police is doing. Shortly after he handed in nomination papers for next year's presidential election. Video obtained by Reuters showed the incident in which a spokesman for Wine's National Unity Party said police bundled the singer-turned-politician into a van. Don't be violent. We will not be violent. Wine, real name Robert Chagulani, is seeking to end President Yoweri Museveni's more than a third of a century in power in February's poll. The 38-year-old, born three years before Museveni first came to power, says his upbringing in a slum near the centre of the capital Kampala means he understands the needs of ordinary Ugandans. Enemy, we know the enemy of Uganda, and that is Museveni. And that, his... alongside the pop star's angry political music, has earned him a large following ahead of the election. All right, thank you. Honourable Nambos. Wine was detained near a venue where nominations were being filed with the electoral body. He was driven in a police van to his compound, which was full of what Wine's camp said were thousands of supporters who'd gathered in protest. Security forces used rubber bullets and tear gas and fired live rounds over the heads of the crowd. An aide speaking from inside the compound said 15 people were injured. In a statement, police said Wine was taken into custody because he planned to hold, quote, illegal processions as he left the nomination venue. They said eight people were injured in skirmishes between security personnel and opposition supporters, and 49 were arrested. We are the leaders of the future, and the future is today. Since expressing his presidential ambitions, police and security forces have regularly dispersed Wine's rallies and beaten or detained his supporters. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. For the second time in recent months, on Tuesday, Zimbabwean police arrested a journalist who has been critical of the government, according to his lawyer, Gift Mtisi. Hopewell Chinono was first arrested in July on charges of writing in support of anti-government protests. This time it was for contempt of court related to a post he made on Twitter. Chinono was detained for more than a month at a maximum security prison until he was released on bail on September 2nd, with one of the conditions being that he stops posting on his Twitter account until his case was finalized. But Chinono opened a new Twitter account, which he has been using to write statements criticizing President Emerson Mnangagwa's government. The arrest of Chinono and dozens of activists has led to accusations that the government is persecuting the opposition, a charge the authorities deny. Ethnic Shona people in Kenya have been demonstrating in recent weeks to demand legal recognition after decades of statelessness. Numbering some 5,000 people, they say they face discrimination and a lack of access to government services. Lenny Rubaga has more from Nairobi. Hundreds of ethnic Shonas have held peaceful marches to press for legal recognition by the Kenyan government. The demands are not new. The Shona migrated to Kenya from Zimbabwe and Zambia more than 50 years ago. They came as missionaries to establish a church and were welcomed by Kenya's first president, Jomo Kenyatta. But successive governments have not granted them or their descendants legal status, so they have no access to government services. We were born in Kenya and they have stuck here all our lives. We are calling on the government to recognize us as citizens of this country. Ishmael Glamini, a Shona, runs a carpentry business and considers himself one of the lucky few who has been able to integrate into the country's formal economy. But he says his community is marginalized in Kenya because they are stateless. As a people, we the Shona are limited economically, since we cannot formally be gainfully employed like other citizens, or indeed pay taxes in order to contribute to building of the Kenyan economy. Supporting our families is also a challenge. The Kenya Human Rights Commission supports the Shona's demand to be formally recognized by the government. All human rights are linked to the state, and the link between a state and an individual is the right to citizenship or nationality, which stateless people lack. So they do not enjoy any state protection. The descendants of the Shona missionaries live mainly in Kiambu, a town within the Kenyan capital region. Recently, they delivered a petition calling for recognition to the Kiambu County Assembly. The assembly speaker, Stephen Ndisho, told VOA it's now up to the government to act. That process left our assembly. It is now with the government. And uh, I'm being informed that it is uh, being fast-tracked. And um, 
once it is done, uh, well and good, they will achieve the status of being citizens. The government has yet to issue an official position on the status of the Shona. However, in August 2019, the government issued around 600 birth certificates to some members of the Shona community. Applications for another 2,000 birth certificates have yet to be acted on or processed. According to a recent UN Human Rights Commission report, there are around 19,000 stateless people living in Kenya. For thousands of Shona like Glamini and others, they can only hope that their status changes for the good. Lenny Rovaga for VOA News, Nairobi, Kenya. Before we take a short break, a reminder to log on to voanews.com for the latest U.S. election news and the too close to call race for the White House. We'll be right back. Hi, 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 you just hi, hi, hi. Being part of our voices is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues, it's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. Welcome back to Africa 54. Across the United States, Americans are still waiting for the final vote tally in battleground states to determine whether incumbent Republican President Donald Trump will continue to be the country's chief executive for the next four years or be replaced by his Democratic challenger, former Vice President Joe Biden. White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has the latest. Street parties in Washington, D.C. And in Miami, Florida on Tuesday night, as an anxious nation awaits the result of the presidential election between incumbent Donald Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden. Neither Trump nor Biden has yet secured the minimum 270 out of 538 electoral votes for victory. U.S. elections are not determined by the popular vote. It looks like it's about 50-50 for either of these candidates. And what is extraordinary is it's turning out to be a rerun of the 2016 election. It's going to come down to almost exactly the same three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania are traditionally Democratic states that Trump won in 2016. Both candidates campaigned heavily there in the final days leading to the vote. In the early hours Wednesday from his hometown in Wilmington, Delaware, Biden urged his supporters to be patient. Keep the faith, guys. We're going to win this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Minutes later, Trump responded, saying Democrats are trying to steal the election in a tweet that Twitter labeled misleading. He later spoke from the White House. It's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this, and we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. Despite the president's claim of victory, ballots will continue to be counted, and it could be days before the winner can be determined. Because of the pandemic as well, we have seen so many more individuals voting 
um, absentee paper ballots. So the demand for that has increased. So um, that's going to slow it down quite a bit as well. Americans cast their ballots in relative calm, despite heavier than usual police presence in some polling stations, as law enforcement brace for election violence following a bitter divisive campaign. With a close vote in several key states and dozens of lawsuits over voting rules that could impact which ballots are counted, the months-long presidential campaign must wait longer for a conclusion. Pat Siwida Kuswara, VOA News at the White House. As we continue our election coverage, a reminder to log on to voanews.com for the latest updates in the race for the White House. Americans went to the polls on Tuesday in one of the most divisive U.S. elections of modern times. VOA's Michael Sullivan reports. Four more years of Donald Trump or a Joe Biden administration. More than 100 million Americans had already made their choice before Election Day and early voting and voting by mail. Amid a pandemic and ready for possible protests, tens of millions cast their ballots on Election Day. I'm very optimistic that things will go smoothly given that we have strong, solid, well-organized democratic institutions in America. In community centers, churches, and at this Los Angeles mosque, people voted. It's important that we exercise our right to vote because that's our way of putting in our voice to change what's going on if we don't like what's going on or just to have a just to have some type of impact. A Biden supporter, she says she voted for change. So did this man, motivated by Black Lives Matter protests. Here in the last year, there's been an awakening in our country to really pay attention to the, the nuances of social injustice and prejudice. This is a critical election, says another voter who thinks the country is already on course. I'm here to vote to make America great again. Um, I'm here to choose who's going to be leading our country and what can I do for my country. Others agree the United States is doing well under Trump. I love that the president wants America to be first. And I just believe that the Republicans are on the right side. This immigrant, however, says the nation has become xenophobic under Trump. We are all immigrants. And that what makes this country great, all of us. And the policy, if it continues, this country will end up living inside a wall. And that we cannot afford. There are worries that the candidates and voters may not accept results of a close election. I think that ultimately the country needs to, you know, own the outcome and come together and unite and um, accept the results either way. Final results could be days or weeks away. Election rules vary around the country, notes a Virginia election official. We'll uh, uh, have some partial results. Today, we won't have because people still have until Friday to get their ballots back to us by mail. In Pennsylvania, Biden voter Beth Jobson says the important thing is for every vote to count. I just pray that they let every vote be counted. We don't have to go to craziness. Let it be counted. And then let's have a conversation. Because I have family members that feel differently, and I still love them. Will the tally go smoothly, and will both parties accept the results? Americans and the world are waiting and watching. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. As we continue our election coverage, log on to voanews.com for continuing updates in race for the White House. The scene in front of the White House was relatively calm Tuesday evening when hundreds of people descended on downtown Washington, D.C., to spend their night watching the election race. VOSIN Deng Bior and Jason Patinkin gave us a closer look at developments throughout the evening. It's election night 2020 and the mood here on Black Lives Matter Plaza is festive. There are musicians, artists, and even a dance group here. Tonight feels a lot like a party, and the organizers and activists behind tonight's events say that is exactly the theme they were going for. They wanted to throw an election watch party. But despite all of this, there is still tension in the air. 
There was chanting closer to Lafayette Square, similar to what we heard months ago during the racial justice protests. People calling for reforms and an end to police brutality. There's also people here carrying political signs for candidates, even as votes are still being counted across the country tonight, creating an air of uncertainty. I spoke to a few people here about what this moment means for America. I think this moment really is going to define who we are as a country today and in the future, um, and I think it's really going to show through to our values and what we want to see in the future and how, how passionate we are to really make a change and to unite as a people to have our voices be heard and to vote out racism and bigotry. Well, I want to be part of the moment and part of the experience, you know, it's, um, it's definitely a big, a big time in history. And I uh, just wanted to be a part of it and share my vibrations. Uh, typically, as an artist, we don't make it outside much. So uh, it's nice to come outside every now and again. And in an environment like this, even being introverted, you can still find your small little capsule of um, cal 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 calamity. Tensions rose later in the evening when police handcuffed at least one person, prompting an angry crowd to gather around them. There was already a heavy presence of police all around the area. VOA attempted multiple times to ask police why they handcuffed the individual, and we received no answer. And now the country waits for a winner to be declared. Ayan Dengbior, VOA News, Washington. We continue our U.S. election coverage with a reminder to log on to voanews.com for the latest updates in race for the White House. In other news, the number of COVID-19 cases worldwide has surpassed 47 million with over 1.2 million deaths, according to the latest data tallied by the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. VOA correspondent Maria Madiello has the latest. The United States leads the world in the number of COVID-19 cases with about 9.3 million infections, according to the latest figures on Tuesday. Experts warn the problem will get worse if Americans don't do more to contain the virus, especially as the colder weather sets in. Rates of growth are alarming. They seem to be as bad or worse than they were back in the spring. A sobering warning as Americans went to the polls on Tuesday, many of whom took the steps to guard against the virus. President Donald Trump has played down the virus, saying for weeks the country is rounding the turn. Rival Joe Biden has criticized the president for his handling of the health crisis. In Utah, Chief Medical Officer Russell Vinick says it's difficult to find qualified staff, even though there's enough protective equipment. Our big issue is the humans, uh, the people you need. Uh, it's not about hospital beds. It's about trained, specialized providers to take care of those patients. Elsewhere, India and Brazil have the second and third highest number of cases. Russia is fourth with over 18,000 coronavirus daily cases, bringing the national tally to more than 1.6 million. Russia has ordered people to wear face masks in some public places and urged regional authorities to consider an overnight curfew on bars and restaurants. Of course I do not want such a lockdown as it was in the spring, because it's closely connected to the economic situation. But putting on a mask at the entrance to a restaurant and immediately taking it off at the table as if the virus would disappear, in my opinion, is also strange. In Paris, riot police pepper sprayed high school students who blockaded the entrance of their school demanding that class sizes be cut in half. Our classes are packed with students sitting side by side. They have tried to rearrange the tables, but it changed nothing because there are still 30 of us in a class. President Emmanuel Macron ordered France back into lockdown Friday, but left schools open. In Spain, health ministry data showed COVID-19 infections rose to over 55,000 on Monday, the biggest increase in that nation since the start of the pandemic. Maria Magiallo, VOA News. Austrian authorities continue to investigate whether more than one attacker was involved in the terrorist shooting in Vienna Monday night that left four people dead and scores wounded. As Henry Rigio reports from London, 
It's the latest in a series of terrorist incidents in Europe in recent days. Austrian police shot dead an assailant Monday night, identified as a 20-year-old Islamist terrorist who was previously jailed for trying to travel to Syria to join Islamic State. He had both Austrian and North Macedonian citizenship. Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz said Tuesday the country was not engaged in a battle between Christians and Muslims, but between civilization and barbarism. It was an attack of hatred, hatred of our basic values, hatred of our way of life, hatred of our democracy, where all people are equal in rights and dignity. Authorities say it is too early to determine whether the attackers were directed from abroad or were simply inspired by Islamic State. Despite their defeat in Iraq and much of Syria, the group's propaganda remains potent, says analyst Sajan Gohel. They still exist online through the internet, the dark web, encrypted messaging. They're still able to get their messaging out. The Vienna attack comes just days after a Tunisian man stabbed to death three people in a church in the southern French city of Nice. The suspect had arrived by boat to the Italian island of Lampedusa as a migrant in September. That was the same route used by the Tunisian migrant who used a truck to attack a Berlin Christmas market in 2016, killing 12 people. The route that ISIS took or encouraging their followers to take may not have been closed off. Last week's attack in Nice came as France was still mourning the death of teacher Samuel Paty, who was beheaded by a Chechen teenager after showing cartoons mocking the Prophet Muhammad during a class on freedom of expression. After that attack, French President Emmanuel Macron described Islam as a religion in crisis. Those comments triggered anti-French protests in Muslim countries around the world. Analyst Gohel says the anger has been fueled by political leaders in those countries. It is a time for cool heads to prevail, for there to be a coming together, not to use a political opportunity to create further tensions and actually incite a violence. European leaders have urged solidarity in the face of the attacks. It shows the will of our enemies to attack what Europe is, a land of culture, of freedoms and values, so we will give no ground. Analysts say Europe faces a difficult battle, standing up for its values without alienating the religious and ethnic communities that are vital in tackling extremism. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thank you for watching.